welcome to the CEC countdown. Now, in case you didn't manage to catch us last week, you kind of hurt my feelings, but I'll fill you in on what's happening here. Basically, this is your hub for college esports over the next few weeks leading up to ESPN's Collegiate Esports Championship event in Houston, which is where we are right now. It Spoiler. Is. I'm Alex Korea, and joining me this week is none other than Glitter Explosion. Yay! Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Alex. And I was actually here, I tuned in last week, and it is crazy to see how much goes down here each and every week. Now, knowing what we have coming up, I can tell you, this week's not any different. Mm. So, we also have some bonus interviews coming up later on that you're definitely going to want to stick around and check out, so don't miss those. And uh, I don't want to hype it up too much, but they include me! That's right, you get to he hear me talk more, so... Good on me. Take that, Mom. And on that note, uh, we're going to be sticking around to see what you viewers at home have to say as well. Go ahead and tweet your comments and questions to hashtag CEC Countdown. We'll be featuring them on later in the show. In the meantime, let's go ahead uh, and talk about Overwatch, our first game yeah. and uh, the most exciting one, or one of the most exciting ones, this week. Absolutely. This week in Overwatch was actually the deciding week for our teams trying to qualify for the CEC. Now, just to catch you guys up at home, the top eight from TESPA's Overwatch Collegiate Championship this season qualify to attend the ESPN Collegiate Esports Championship live in Houston, where they will play on the big stage to see who can take home that championship trophy. A few of the games really came down to the wire this time around, especially the match between UC Irvine and Grand Canyon University. Yes, and just like Rob Thomas said, it was a hot one. Let's dive into it. That GCU and UC Irvine series was absolutely incredible. Grand, uh, Grand Canyon was actually the 18th seed going into this tournament. And this is a team that was coming off a big upset last week when they took out UC San Diego. It looked like UC Irvine, who was placed number two in the league with a lot of experience under their belts, had all the advantages going into this week's penultimate series. But the match was actually a lot closer than you probably expect. Now let's actually dive into that match, starting with game one. TESPA's rules dictate that the first match be control point, a King of the Hill style faceoff where both teams fight to take and hold the center. Now UC Irvine came out of the gate strong, running a quad DPS composition that focused on putting out an overwhelming amount of raw firepower. Using this strategy, Irvine surrounded the objective and hit Grand Canyon from every angle. GCU couldn't deal with all the threats quickly enough and lost the point initially after losing key members. A little bit of back and forth, and UC Irvine managed to hold on to their starting lead and take that first round. Ooh, but the story does not end there. Round two saw UC Irvine change up their strategy to something a bit more standard, as both teams opted for a safe defensive three tank, three support setup, which, after my math, equals six, and that's how many players there are. This type of matchup is really all about boxing out the other team. So when Irvine established strong control of the objective early on, they started to run away with the game. You see Irvine took map one on Lee Jang Tower, gaining a decisive 1-0 lead, which set themselves up quite nicely, if I do say so myself, to run away with the whole series. Now, Grand Canyon still had plenty of room to come back, though, with four maps left. Mm. King's Row would be the location for game number two, King's Row is a hybrid attack, defense, and payload map where teams take turns accomplishing a variety of objectives on both defense and offense. The teams went back and forth, ending in a dead tie. So that meant overtime. Each team had just one chance to attack and take as many objectives as possible. And after fierce battles, it was Grand Canyon that came out victorious, cracking UC Irvine and bringing the series back one to one. Ooh, this is heating up. It one is. to one. Let's get into it. Game three, uh, Horizon Lunar Colony was actually the third map of the series, similar to the map before. Both teams took turns attacking and defending a location. Grand Canyon started on defense with a strategy focused on holding one particular piece of high ground, but unfortunately, it fell apart quickly as they were forced off immediately by a clever play from UC Irvine. Not ready to fight on the low ground, GCU's defense fell apart and Irvine was able to take a huge early lead. This lead proved too much to come back from as Grand Canyon couldn't catch back up. UCI took the map and regained their lead now at 2-1. to one. 
Now, on map four, it was win or go home for Grand Canyon. Mm. UC Irvine needed just one more map win to take the series and qualify for the CEC. The map chosen was Route 66, an escort map where each team has a time bank to attack and try to push a payload as far as possible within that time. GCU was first on offense and fans' hearts absolutely dropped as they didn't make any early progress. Things were looking bad, but as the game went on, they won more engagements and pushed toward the third stage. Grand Canyon was just barely able to complete the map, putting them in a good spot to hold off UCI and tie the series back up despite Irvine's efforts. GCU capped the momentum up and locked up map number four. Ooh, that was riveting. You're a regular Agatha Christie. Oh, yeah, well, me on the edge you. of my seat. Now, it all came down to this last map, and that was Nepal. Yes, this was another King of the Hill style map, the same type of map that UC Irvine crushed Grand Canyon on in game one. Both teams fought fiercely up to the point where they were both fully tied up with one more round to go to decide it all. Irvine came out the gate with their DPS players playing particularly well. They pushed out GCU and took command and control of the point, holding it for quite a while. Well, with only seconds remaining, Grand Canyon mounted one final push and after a chaotic fight, took it back. They themselves took strong control of the point and held it all the way to 99% completion. So close! And in a do or die situation, UC Irvine flared up with one final unlikely push and succeeded. They took the point back uh, just seconds away from victory at 86% completion. Grand Canyon had to scramble, and it looked like UCI had clinched the entire series. But amazingly, with one final Hail Mary, Grand Canyon's players took their play to another level in the final fight to decide the series. When the smoke cleared, they were the ones left standing. But only barely. Grand Canyon took the final round 100 to 99% in one of the closest games of the series. They qualified for the CEC. They're going to Houston. I'm using this tone for the rest of the show. Let that it honestly... There's no doubt that that was one of the most intensely contested matches we have ever seen throughout this season. These teams fought it out until the very end. I mean, in overtime on the third round of the fifth map, it literally doesn't get any closer than that. They weren't the only ones fighting last week. However, you can go back and watch many of the games as colleges all fought hard to earn their place. At the end of the week, we had our eight teams with the other seven being Maryville, Carleton, New Jersey Institute of Technology, Harrisburg, Orange Coast College, Rutgers, and Utah. We will be highlighting these teams over the next few weeks leading up to the CEC. Whew, what a week of Overwatch. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to grip the wheel and turn into StarCraft land. The StarCraft II team brawl is currently Underway, it's a novel format where three players from the same college compete as individuals, taking on three players from opposing teams in one-on-one -on -one matches in best of three series. And we've seen the teams in this tournament display a wide range of strategies in some extremely exciting matches. So let's take a look at the teams in the running to take the top seeds in these brackets. Yes, the University of Chicago, which is currently in fifth place, took their first two losses this week. <laughs> Falling to Waterloo A, 1-2, to two, and then UC San Diego, 0-2. to two. They were able to take one match later on in the week, but overall a rough road for Chicago. UC San Diego picked up some important wins over George Mason in round 7 and Chicago in round 8. Both were 2-0, and oh, they, and they really had a shot to beat Waterloo A in round 9. This is definitely one we want to go into some detail about, so let's dive in. All right, let me paint you a picture. Waterloo started with their best player, the Riddler, who went up against UC San Diego's player, Light. The Riddler is known to play very well in long games, so Light tried a fast, aggressive strategy. Despite trying his best to keep Riddler uh, <laughs> in the dark by denying scouts, Light's big early attack was stopped. Trying to keep anyone in the dark was Light's first mistake, I think, given his name and all. Oh, <laughs> thanks for explaining that joke. In game two, UC San Diego's player Dragon God would need to effectively scout Waterloo player Buster to figure out his strategy early and counter it. He did exactly that, which let him know where Buster's army was. Using this information, Dragon God came in from two sides to surround Buster's army. Buster's units were out of position, and Dragon God capitalized, taking out almost everything and gaining an insurmountable lead. 
Dragon God was much stronger at this point, easily routing Buster. Knowing a loss was inevitable, Buster conceded the game. And I'm going to call it right now in the name of uh, in the game of best names. I'm going to say Dragon God beats Buster. Unfortunately. Oh yeah, 100%. Yeah. Although, let's get back to the game. With the series tied one to one, game three was expected to be a conservative one, with both players trying to play it safe with the whole series on the line. But that was the exact opposite for what happened when UC San Diego's player Flume faced Yen Fu from Waterloo. From the start, Yen Fu chose to rush Flume early, using excellently managed units. Within only a couple of minutes, the sheer army control and an early attack from Yen Fu took Flume completely by surprise. Unable to defend against this early pressure, Yen Fu took out Flume's entire economy and infrastructure, ending the game almost before it had begun. Flume fell apart and conceded, wrapping up the game for Yen Fu in a quick 2 minutes and 36 seconds. With that win, Waterloo's A-team took the entire match. I really didn't expect that to be how the last game ended. I figured it would be a long slog till the end. Mm -hmm. Yen Fu really made the right call with that surprise attack and executed it flawlessly. I'm excited to see what's going to happen next week, too. There are a lot of great matches coming up that you won't want to miss. So don't do it. Stick here. We'll see UC San Diego's take on Waterloo B in round 10, followed by UC Berkeley in round 11. Berkeley also faces the University of Chicago in round 10, and the two Waterloo teams meet in round 11. That's going to be awkward. Yeah, they might well. know each other. Uh, this handful of matches could have a huge impact on how the rest of the standings turn out, because only one team can win. These top teams will be handing each other's losses left and right in next week's matches. Now, while those teams have difficult schedules ahead, we see the University of Chicago actually has a relatively easier schedule, avoiding the top teams in next week's contests. If they can pick up wins in these three matches, knowing that some of these other top teams will be taking losses, they might be able to catapult into the top four. This is potentially a huge chance for them. Well, we have covered a lot of games, and we're only two games in, so I need a break. So let's take one. You can even use this time to, one, relax, but two, tweet your comments and questions through hashtag CEC Countdown. And who knows? We may even pick you, kid, to feature later on in the show. And when we come back, we have everything Hearthstone and part one of a very special interview with Rick Fox. Special because it's with me. He's a former pro basketball player and owner of the professional esports team, Echo Fox. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I managed to sit down and then be subsequently dwarfed by Rick Fox, owner of the professional team Echo Fox, earlier this week to get his thoughts on college esports and even how it relates to his experience as a professional athlete. I also asked him for a jacket. I don't know if that's going to make it in there, but he didn't give me one. We have that coming up pretty soon, right after covering what happened this week in Hearthstone. Absolutely. I mean, I can't wait. I can't wait for anything. Well. We're just going to let him have a moment. Sorry, let's keep going. Good? Yeah? Yeah. All right. Well, that. this week, we saw teams competing for regional Swiss tournament spots as seeding came down to the wire in the TESPA Collegiate Championships Open Division. In the final week of the regular season, squads from all four regions solidified themselves 
as the top contenders to succeed in the regional Swiss. Mm. From the North Region, University of Waterloo captured the top seed after dispelling Grand Valley State University 3-2 on Wednesday. Waterloo owns the North's only undefeated record at 7-0, but have not been dominant against top competitors. Along with Grand Valley in this last match, Indiana University and Southern Illinois University also took Waterloo to five games in their matches. All three squads joined Waterloo in the regional Swiss with 6-1 records. In the East region, both Colby College and Williams College continued their unbeaten play entering the regional Swiss. Williams battled back from a 2-1 deficit to beat Rochester Institute of Technology, while Colby dispensed of Vassar College 3-1. RIT enters the regional Swiss right behind the two undefeated teams at 6-1 as Vassar slides in with a 5-2 record. Yes, uh, my brother actually goes to Rochester Institute of Technology. Does he? It's very cold and it's mostly men. So, a lot of good time to play Hearthstone. Sounds like an unfortunate college pick. Yeah. Well, what he can get into. St. Petersburg College, uh, which I'm also being told is in North America somehow, <laughs> claimed the sole undefeated record in the South region by defeating Florida State. With the next six teams in the region having 6-1 records, the tiebreaker mechanics are a little bit tricky. Houston fell to St. Petersburg 3-0 in Week 6, but bounced back to beat University of Florida 3-1 in Week 7 to clinch a 6-1 record. Florida State defeated Clemson University's team 3-2 in Round 6. FSU fell to St. Petersburg the following week to finish the season 6-1 before the regional Swiss. But out in the West, where I'm from, that's the accent I chose for that, where I'm from, out in the West, Santa Clara University preserved their unbeaten streak with a 3-2 victory over the University of Southern California. Santa Clara sits at 7-0, the only undefeated team in the entire West. UCLA and UC Davis follow closely behind both teams taking from Simon Fraser University in round seven to lock in 6-1 performances. Forget about it! Now, as a reminder, all teams with records of 5-2 or better actually qualify for the regional Swiss tournaments. Next, the top eight teams from each regional Swiss will advance to their region's playoffs. There, the teams will attempt to secure their spot within the top three to advance onto the championship bracket for a chance to play at the live CEC event. Yes. In the varsity division, the top four teams from each round robin group are locked in for the varsity playoffs. Each playoffs group include one team from each of the round robin groups. Let's take a look at qualifying teams, shall we? In group one, we have Southern New Hampshire University, Defiance College, Robert Morris University, Illinois, and University of Oregon. Out of the three teams, RMU had the most impressive performance in the round robin phase. Their loss to Wyoming aside, they still have a 72% win across all of their games uh, of these best of three series. RMU takes on Southern New Hampshire in the first round of the playoffs. University of Akron, the University of Jamestown, Northeastern University, and Texas Wesleyan make up Group 2. Northeastern is quite an outlier from the rest of this group, finishing at 11-2. Akron and Jamestown finished at 7-3, and Texas Wesleyan at 7-4. So not too shabby. No. The 2, 3, and 4 seeds seem very close, so it's still wide open for this group's second championship spot. Group 3 is another evenly matched group with teams fiercely vying for top spots. Texas Tech comes out of the group number one, but Mason is boasting an impressive win percentage of 70%. These two teams have the best chance at the championship slots from this group. Group 4 is stacked with talented teams. Miami and Harrisburg both put up a string of impressive results during the group phase with Harrisburg tied for first. These two teams stand apart from the competition and will make it difficult for the others to find a path to the championship. Absolutely. And speaking of champions, I had a chance to sit down with Rick Fox to discuss his thoughts on esports and how it intersects with his experience as a professional athlete. Hello, everyone. Very special Road to CEC presentation. I'm Alex Korea, and I'm currently being dwarfed not just in physical size, but also by talent by an esports entrepreneur, a sports legend, and one hell of a dad. I'm here with Rick Fox. How's it going, Rick? I'm good. How was Thank that? You. What do you think that was That was good? a pretty good introduction. I'm just trying to become your official hype man. So right. I can just be behind you, waving a white towel above your head That's at all times. I don't know how I'm going to live up to it. Yeah, I mean, listen, you're already talking to me, so you're doing better than I am doing altogether. Well, you, you said the one thing that probably means the most to me is that I'm a good dad. I don't know if you've checked with Kyle on that one, but 
I hope he agrees with you. I don't know how he would say otherwise, but I believe it. And also, uh, you're also a dad, which I hope I'm not, because, man, I wouldn't know about it. <laughs> Regardless. Have you checked recently? <laughs> Trust me, I keep checking. Okay, good. Still no. No, good. Uh, let's go ahead. I, I want to talk about, uh, we are currently inside of Echo Fox right now. We are yes, in the heart are. of the beast. We're yes, here. Uh, first of all, where can I get a jacket? Okay, uh, one of these. I, I know someone you can talk to. Okay, cool. Probably me. We'll talk about that afterwards. Right. My bad. That was yeah. very selfish of me. No, no, no. You have to stay focused. <laughs> me uh, first. Also, uh, I want to talk about, uh, obviously, CEC. It's all about collegiate esports. You were uh, an, an, uh, you are not only an esportser, you are a regular sportser, um, yeah. both uh, professionally but also in college. So I kind of want to talk about those worlds and those parallels, because okay. naturally, people always try to parallel those things. So um, first of all, can you talk about your time going through the uh, NCAA and, and all that stuff? Yeah. College experience. I went to the University of North Carolina, go Heels. Mm. Uh, fell a little short in the uh, Final Four uh, journey, but uh, your we grades have, were we, great. We, my, yeah, great grades were grades were great. <laughs> uh, we we also now are proud to say have an esports club at, at uh, in, in University of North Carolina. So we're proud of those guys. Uh, but for me personally, I went to school and <coughs> uh, uh, back a few years. You uh, said uh, you said 1998, really <laughs> softly. No, it was actually 1988. <laughs> 88 to 91, I played four years at the University of North Carolina under Dean Smith. For those of you who never heard of Dean Smith, he is a legendary basketball coach. Uh, the likes of maybe your era today would know of uh, Mike Krzyzewski. I played against uh, Coach Krzyzewski when he was at Duke and he mm -hmm. just started. But I played basketball. Uh, so I represented uh, the Tar Heels and I uh, had four years there and then graduated uh, uh, to go on to play for the Celtics and the Lakers. So, so naturally, I mean, you're already kind of doing, you're drawing these parallels between uh, maybe uh, collegiate and pro sports and that kind of path into what people are trying to do today. Um, and, and right now, I think a lot of people would argue that that system isn't necessarily in place. Sure, there's scholarships and we've gotten over the point where it's like, hey, people can play games professionally, people can play games in college, but I, I want to ask, how do you think uh, the, the world of professional sports, how can we use what we know and, and right. we know works to get people into pro leagues, how, do, how can we use that uh, to kind of, uh, as a model for esports? Because right now, it doesn't happen a lot. You don't have people, a lot of people getting drafted from college teams. Um, no, it's, it's happening more and more. We don't necessarily have a draft process. Mm -hmm. We have a scouting process here in, in the belly of the beast, as you said. <laughs> um, this is actually our production room, not our actually offices. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, but we we do look for talent in all places, mm -hmm. you know, globally. Uh, and some of that talent that's bubbling up is coming through the college scene. Mm -hmm. Now, the NCAA, as we well know, uh, has a huge handle on a lot of the traditional sporting uh, competitions that we've seen over the years. But now esports and esports clubs have done an amazing job of creating their own tournament systems among themselves, mm -hmm. uh, creating competitive and competition competitive environments and competitions and tournaments, mm -hmm. which I love to see. Uh, so I think that'll continue to grow, and I don't know if it necessarily needs the stamp of an NCAA mm -hmm. uh, structure. Uh, I just think it needs to continue to get the attention that it's getting like in this format. So I love that the students are out competing. I love that ESPN is providing this opportunity for that to happen, mm -hmm. and, and I think uh, we'll start to see more of them find their way to the next level like I did as an NBA basketball player. I was a college basketball player and I got a, a chance to have a career in my, my life playing basketball. Mm, inspiring. And Rick was pretty good too. Um, I really liked getting his perspective on, on all that. You know, a lot of times you talk to people who are esports through and through, but he's got a perspective of pro sports that's similar, but on a way different scale that you normally don't get to hear about a lot. Yeah, it was really nice. Yeah, I thought it was great. Was that because I was in it? No, unfortunately for you, it wasn't. All right, we're going to take another break, but don't go anywhere because we actually have more Rick Fox to show you. And surprise, there's a part two where we dig deeper into how college esports can be a path to pro. So if you're interested in that, stick around. In the meantime, don't forget to send any comments or questions in by tweeting hashtag CEC countdown. We're going to be going over them later in the show. We'll see you there. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back. We have part two of our special, special interview with Rick Fox, owner of professional esports team Echo Fox, in just a bit. In the meantime, we still have plenty to cover for this week in Heroes of the Storm. Absolutely. TESPA Collegiate Series Heroes of the Storm just wrapped up its fifth week of competition. In the first stage of the tournament, a Swiss format is used where teams with the same record face off against each other. Each week gets intense as undefeated teams will constantly be matched up at the end of the six weeks of group play. All of the teams will be placed into a playoff bracket based on their performance with only one undefeated team. Going in as the top seed is huge for limiting a potential early round loss, giving top seeded teams a better shot at making it to the Collegiate Esports Championship here in Houston. And who doesn't want to come to Houston? Everybody wants Everyone to wants come to come there. to Houston. We're it's here. the place to be. I'm here. Every well, now no one wants to come. I'm not going to be here. Okay, we're safe. This week, we watched undefeated Rutgers taking on 3-1 Arizona State and the battle of the two undefeated teams, Robert Morris University, Illinois, versus Cal Poly Pomona. In the Rutgers versus Arizona State match, ASU were the underdogs in the match, but knew they had a chance. In Heroes of the Storm, one team gets to choose the map the game is played on. Uh, which can heavily influence a team's strategy, of course. Each map has a unique feature and objective that serves as the central point of conflict. ASU chooses the map Braxis Holdout, knowing Rutgers' strategies weren't as strong there. Arizona State knew their best chance was to force Rutgers into many, many, many consecutive fights. Now, after the map selection, the teams get to choose their heroes in a pick-ban phase. ASU used their hero selection to further their strategy. ASU's heroes had very little sustain, forcing them to try and open fights by picking off one of the Scarlet Knights. Yes, uh, a low sustained strategy can be very strong, but it does come with risks. If you allow your opponents to stabilize during the fight, it's very hard to come back. ASU understood these risks, though, uh, and put the pressure on Rutgers, forcing them to use key defensive abilities early on uh, to give ASU an opportunity to do massive bursts of damage. Rutgers, on the other hand, played a much safer strategy, a more standard composition, uh, but more flexible with more turnaround potential. Now, despite taking an expected early lead, ASU couldn't close the game out as Rutgers adapted and took advantage of ASU's all-in playstyle. Once Rutgers mastered how to stop ASU from efficiently moving around the map and prevented them from making the most of their high burst potential, they were able to swing the game in their favor and win game one. Yes, game two was also played on a small, aggressive map, Battlefield of Eternity, forcing engagement between the teams. Arizona and Rutgers both played similar strategies to before, with Arizona going high damage and aggressive while Rutgers went slow and defensive. Arizona made an all-in push, and it was successful, but Rutgers halted their advance after winning a team fight, capitalizing on their advantage. The Scarlet Knights picked up an objective and made a counter push. Rutgers started controlling the map and extending their lead, giving them an opportunity to get ahead on their map positioning. Despite looking like another Rutgers win, ASU caught Rutgers in a combo of Maeve's Warden's Cage and Orpheus Crushing Jaws, taking out their team and making a beeline for the Scarlet Knights' core. ASU saw their opportunity, took a calculated fight, and managed to pull off a last-minute victory to tie the series one-to-one. -one. ASU took a different approach in Game 3. Learning from past mistakes, ASU took a conservative approach and played it safe in the early game. The reserved posturing paid off as ASU won multiple important early team fights. Rutgers hung on in spite of the Sun Devils' improved strategy, and the game went very long, where it usually comes down to one decisive Fight. Rutgers took that fight to ASU and wiped them in a single team fight that decided the game and the entire series, with Rutgers coming out the winner and maintaining their dominance. Mm, listen, that is probably the only thing New Jersey is dominant at. And I'm from there, born and raised. So you would know. Yeah, I'd know. It's pretty much video games and sandwiches. These games were classic Rutgers, though. They recognized win conditions, plotted out the steps to get there, and then waited for their opportunity. They didn't stumble and executed with discipline and precision. ASU showed that Rutgers isn't invincible. They do overextend. Both of these teams pulled off some impressive combos. Rutgers has well-thought-out team compositions, and their decision-making and big-picture awareness highlight just how good of a team they actually are. So let's go ahead and take out the old eSports binoculars and look ahead to next week. We have the battle of the last undefeated teams, 
Uh, week six is the last week of the group stage of this tournament. These final two teams, Rutgers and Cal Poly Pomona, will face off in the most hyped match of the tournament so far. Rutgers has set the bar high. In best of three matches, they've only given up two games in this entire tournament. One against number three UC Berkeley in week four, and this week's to ASU. This shows the team isn't invincible, but even with these losses, they're extremely formidable. They're, not, they're the most refined and well-rounded team in this tournament. They know when to play aggressively, but rarely get overly aggressive. They have a strong command of game mechanics and an excellent sense of situational awareness. They have fundamentals down and they're consistent, which are two crucial characteristics for a team wanting to make a deep run, potentially all the way to the finals. Yes, Cal Poly Pomona is shaping up to be a formidable team as well. They've notched wins 2-0 over number five, University of Houston, and number three, RMU Illinois. Now they have two forfeit wins, but taking into account they only took quick 2-0 wins over some of these top teams, they've proven their team to be reckoned with, and they've executed brilliant plays and can land difficult combos. But we haven't seen them in a match where they are down. It will be interesting to see if Rutgers can be the first team to put them in that position. Now, we've covered nearly every game, but there's still one more game. Mm. Street Fighter V. Mm. The best part is that it hasn't happened yet. So, college students, you guys still have a chance to shape the narrative itself. Signups end April 19th, so students still have a chance to register and qualify for the live ESPN Collegiate Esports Championship in May. Definitely. If you are a college student into Street Fighter, it's a fantastic opportunity. We had our own opportunity, actually, this week to sit down with pro esports team owner Rick Fox and get a ton of great insight into his thoughts about how esports can be a path to pro for students. We got a peek at part one earlier, so let's go ahead and dive right into part two. What do you think a, a collegiate program would do to help a pro player? How do you think it would prepare them? Because you're a proponent of that kind of thing. What do you think it does? Well, I w I'm going to go back to my, my college coach, Dean Smith, who really put a heavy focus on as, as his responsibility to mm -hmm. my parents and to me to make sure that I was first a student athlete. Mm. And so I required, it required me to pay attention to both sides of my college experience, which was the academic one and the, uh, the you know, competitive one. Mm. Um, now I also had a social side that got in the way <laughs> of both of those at times, but I think everyone can connect to that. Um, but what, what the pursuit of excellence does in general for any student athlete mm -hmm. is, is the, it brings out the best in them. Anything you put your, your, your attention to, you wanna do it 100% of your capability to evolve to the best version of yourself. That for some people will land them at the highest level and maybe they will find themselves in years from now being professional uh, pros for Echo Fox. That would be amazing, right? But for those that fall short, what I, what I am really stressing uh, um, recently and I want people to know, especially I'm saying this for the parents out there. So if you guys are students out there, point this section of the, of the interview to your parents. Uh, okay. But the point being is that it's okay for, your, you know, for you to support your kid, your son, mm -hmm. your daughter, in their passion around video games. Mm -hmm. My son, you know what he does now? He's a, he's a game designer. He's an wow. independent game designer. He wanted to be an eSports pro. Mm -hmm. And maybe someday he will, he will be. And that's the beauty of it, right? Yeah. It's, it's ageless. It's sexless. It's raceless. It's it, all the things that will typically at times create boundaries for people. Mm -hmm. There's none of that in eSports. And I love that. And, and look, can we create more opportunities? And I, to, for others, yes. It's just about getting the word out and educating them. And you're doing that. We're doing it. This league is doing that. And so I'm, I'm excited to see what spawns from it going forward. Well, one of the biggest criticisms I see of, and, and there are some people who have criticisms about a program like this, is that like, well, the age of players is a certain set age. And you're saying that's not the case. But more importantly, I think a, a program, and tell me if I'm wrong, but a program like this, and you mentioned it a little bit, is something that prepares people for the life you may live as a professional. You have yeah. to play the game, but you have to have a life around it. And if you're a pro, you got to do interviews. You oh, got to do junkets. You got to do a bunch of different things. That's not the game. And a lot of young people who don't go to these collegiate programs have a problem with life. They left their parents' yeah, house. Yeah. And it's something like the, again, not just the NCAA, but yeah. a program like this, it prepares them for more than just the game. Sure does. Uh, I, you, that's, I could unpack so much there in that, <laughs> in that question and statement. Um, we are a professional organization, which means we require those that work here, mm -hmm. those that represent us in competition, to conduct themselves professionally, mm -hmm. right? So much of that is lost and missed 
when when in traditional sports even when individuals go from say straight from high school or from a young age or straight from college mm -hmm. into the pros where they're not socially prepared they don't understand how to conduct themselves uh, maybe professionally they don't know how to handle the criticism they don't know how to deal with the money all the things that that happen uh, along the way are, are things that I think are, can be stumbling blocks for for a young a young young individual that's looking to have a career anywhere in life, let alone in professional sports. So what I think is uh, transpiring now is the opportunity to grow as an adult through this program and through the um, and through the eSports uh, e Championship Series here is young student athletes are going to get a chance to feel what it's like to compete, but also grow as student athletes. So as we're drawing parallels, I think it's kind of safe to assume that the parallels aren't infinite. You can't just say, hey, we're going to make something. And you've already kind of said it. You can't just make something like the NCAA for eSports. Um, and you see a lot of people coming in and, and uh, investing in eSports, but they're using their old sports knowledge, and a lot of that just doesn't work. So what do you feel might need to change from an organization like that, from what we know about those kind of college organizations? Yeah, I think the structure has to be put in place, some structure, right? But I think an openness to creating a structure that's a, a, a new, mm -hmm. uh, really suited and, and best for esports, not trying to lay over what has been before on top of this community. It's not, I don't think it's, it, it'll work uh, to the level that has capabilities of, of working if we do that. So we have to stay open-minded. We have to have these type of conversations. We have to take the, the, the experience we have through the college esports championship here now and really uh, grow it and adjust and, and look at what's working and what's not working and go from there. Well, it's, uh, it's the Wild West. It's the Oregon Trail and hopefully you bring enough oxen. Uh, thank you so much for sitting down with me, sir. My I pleasure, appreciate man. it. We will see you at the, the CEC, I assume. Yeah, I look forward to seeing and watching all of you compete. And hopefully you're going to bring me a jacket. Yes, there we go. All, all right. right, thank you. I am a female small, please. <laughs> we'll see you guys. Man, uh, insightful, eloquent, and handsome. And Rick was there too, so that's good. Um, I was, I was first of all, super impressed. Rick is a busy guy, and listen, I know him as a, an actor, a, a basketball player, a dancer of sorts, but he really knows about esports, and he really cares about getting college-age kids into the professional scene. It's he awesome. absolutely does. I've actually had a couple chances here and there to catch up with Rick myself, and he is dedicated, to mm. say the least, to esports, and I, I'm a big fan of that. You guys like hang out? He never calls me for stuff like we're, that. We're best friends. All right. Well, uh, hey, we want to hear from you. We've been collecting your questions and comments over the course of the show, and you still have an opportunity to get in on the action by tweeting hashtag CEC countdown. When we come back, we will dive in, talk about some of them, and show off our top 10 college esports plays of the week. We'll be right back. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the CEC Countdown. Now, as you can see, Glitter Explosion and I have made our way over to what has been dubbed the lounge. Although yeah. you got the couch, you can easily lounge. I can't lounge in this. I'm quite comfortable here. Oh, let me get a quick lounge on. Is that 
Does that look comfortable? No, it's inappropriate. Very natural. Well, right now we're going to, uh, in the lounge, respond to your Twitter questions and comments. I hope you guys didn't let us down out there. <laughs> when does Twitter let anybody down, really, though? I mean, they let me on the platform, so oh, that right. was whatever. Well, we have high expectations for you guys, so let's go ahead and dive in right now. Now, our first tweet comes from Tuner's Edge, and he asks, uh, what do you think is the most underrated role in college esports? Interesting question. Hmm. Um, and can I take the floor here? You certainly may. Please, everyone, everyone clear out. Um, I'm going to say it's the commentators, the casters, the talent, the people who have to talk about the games. I got to come in, sit under bright lights, sit on an uncomfortable chair, and I had to tie my own tie today. I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but it's just really hard putting it all together and making cohesive sentences, words. Sometimes I have to read. It's really tough. Well, Yours? You know, that... You probably agree, right? I feel like... No, I don't at all. No, completely disagree. I am actually going to go ahead and give a totally different response, and I am going to say that it is the support staff mm. for these events, whether that's coaches or managers or even the people doing the production of the event itself. They are always So you're saying, like, uh, you know, anywhere from, like, assistant coaches all the way to, say, if they're in a house and they have a chef, if they have any cleaning services. Any, any of them. They all count. Anyone who might have to smell a teen house. Especially those people. <laughs> even their neighbors. Anyone yes. who's even within sniff that range. That is support, okay? Th listen. And, hey, you're within my sniff range, so you never know. Your job might be hard. You're a commentator. Back to my point, I was correct. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and get to our second tweet, shall we? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Right, we have affidavit David coming in asking, who is the second best-looking owner in esports after Rick Fox? Oh, now that one, the first one, that was a softball. This one, <laughs> that's a curve right down the plate. Um, that's tough. Uh, nope, Robert Kraft. He ages like fine wine. <laughs> Great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I had to pick a close second. No, It'd probably to, be. <laughs> you, have to, you have to do another one. You have to take uh, another one. And, uh, but, well, first of all, hey, I love me a silver <laughs> fox um, or an echo fox. They're all good. But I'm going to say Andy Din. Andy Din, he's, okay. got that, he's got that youthful glow. He's got, well, he's 24, and that's how old I am. So I'm going to say prime age. All right. It's like a, it's like a, a steak, like a very expensive steak. You can relate a little steak. bit. What? You can relate a little totally. bit. Totally. Yeah. And we'll see. Maybe uh, esports, uh, sometimes it ages people fast. So we'll see how long that. Uh, I'm actually 12, so that, I look terrible for a 12-year-old. But esports really it ages people fast. But Rick has done a very good job uh, yeah, I mean, keeping young. Rick does look fabulous, but yeah. I am going to have to say Drake. I don't think that's a real answer. It is totally Drake is completely own a real team. answer. He invested in a team. He is a co-owner in Hundred Thieves. That, no, I think he's an investor. Well, he's both. And you're also downplaying Nade Shot. Uh, Great beard. Yeah. There's I'm, secrets in there. Maybe a Skittle. I don't know. I'm going to give all the credit in the world to Nate Shot. He's got perfectly vertical and coiffed hair. So yeah. uh, if you want, oh, fine. We'll, give, we'll give it to Nate Shot. We'll give it to Nate Shot. Nate Shot. All right. I can agree with that. Right after my man, Robbie Kraft, baby. Mmm. <laughs> uh, let's go ahead and get to our third tweet here. It comes from, I literally never said this right, and I read it on Twitter <laughs> a million times. <clears throat> Merc Mercilix? Merc Merc Merkelix. Yeah, one of those is right. Uh, do they allow spectators during the CEC main event, he asks on Twitter. Ooh, that's a tough one. You know what? I'm going to make a call right now on my special ESPN phone. And just, John just, ESPN. Just give him a minute. Listen, buddy. Baby, listen. Can you let people into that event? Like general public? Yes? Wow, you're the best. All right. No, I haven't had dinner yet. All right, I love you too. Bye. Uh, listen, I just called it in. You're not going to believe it. You can attend the CEC event. It's possible. You can get tickets now. There is going to be general admission for the CEC event. You're welcome. I did is that, it, me. I didn't know you had that much power. I've got a lot of power. And influence. Yeah. I didn't actually tie my own tie. I made someone else do it. Seems a little skeptical. I'm, I'm a little skeptical. Of how, of Listen, if you, okay. want, if you want to attend the event here in Houston, first of all, who doesn't want to come to Houston? Fair. Second of all, it's very easy. All you got to do is check out the CEC website. We have a Discord server as well if you want to post some memes up in there. We but do. also ask how you can get tickets. It's very easy. All you got to do is look on the internet, and you'll find yourself some tickets, and you can come, and maybe I'll be there. Or maybe not, because I'll be hanging off a helicopter making business deals. You never know. That's a realistic depiction of what he does in his day-to-day -day life. Yeah. You know, or, or just hanging out, like hanging off monkey bars at a local playground. <laughs> Um, but we actually have to take a quick break right now. Um, but we saved some of the best questions for last, which is not to downplay the ones we already got, but I have to tease something. Uh, when we come back, we'll get to a couple more tweets to show you this week's top 10 plays. We'll be right back.
We are back. Don't call it a comeback. Mostly because we've just been sitting here for the first for the last 90 seconds. But let's go ahead and get back into it. We are going to get back into the top plays of the week in just a few minutes. But first, we want to do a couple more of your tweets. Just a couple more. Your questions, your comments. Let's get to the next All one, right, shall so we? So we have at Hanna who says, I bet every kid in esports wishes they had a dad like Rick Fox. He seems so supportive. I know. It's great. And it's not just that he's supportive. Because this is all because he wanted to connect with his son, who actually strangely went to school with Kyle. Um, I didn't finish Small college. World. But <laughs> Kyle was an overachiever compared to me. <laughs> but um, uh, it's just because he wanted to connect with his son. And also, uh, we were talking about this before the show, it's just crazy that uh, someone's dad knows about eSports because it's very hard to relate. I don't know if your parents know about eSports. I mean, I've, I've taught my parents well. Mm. They are learning. Can you talk to my parents? <laughs> I can, I'm actually a good teacher. I can definitely Great. help them. Teach my mom how to uh, install a printer driver, please, because I love my mom. <laughs> Esports would be like psh, way over her head. So if you want to break, if you have like a, a Wikipedia page to share or something, please do. I actually I have an Esports 101 handbook for parents. That's good. My yeah. mom, anything anything analog, she loves to touch. And 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 Rick is he's listen. He's he's a smart guy, and he's he's not just in on the technical aspects. Um, he also plays the game too. He's exactly. talking. Exactly. He's like, I start as a Lissandra La 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 main, and my mom would be like, "Is that a friend of yours?" It's, <laughs> it's 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 crazy. And he's also super business minded, so he can build a team in an organization that helps out other players. So ultimately, it's 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 really awesome that he's a force in this community. Um, but let's go ahead and check out the next question here. It's from Defy Rob. He asks, "Do you think the push to develop programs for college students uh, looking to go pro will continue?" Now, that's a good question. It's a great question. Do you have any thoughts on this? Because I have a thought on it. You know what? You can, you can do your thought first. Wow. Huge mistake. So here's, how my, here's my take on it. Basically, like, it, it's not the fun answer, but it's, it's kind of how things work, is that once, as long as people support this kind of thing, uh, just like ESPN's doing with this entire event, is like, it's not just giving optics and, and, and giving it a platform, but it's also like funding these things, having prize pools, paying for the venue, paying for... These couches and chairs, it's like if they put the support, if they really care about it enough to keep injecting money into it to keep it growing, then yeah, of course. Um, but that's just kind of the way the industry and the world works. That's how entertainment is made. So um, I, I really think so long as uh, generous um, organizations like ESPN keep supporting them, I 100%. think they'll keep going. Yeah, and if you guys are wanting to somehow help further that, the way you can do that is by making it worth all of these big groups' money. Make it more mainstream. You know, expose your friends to it if they don't know what it is or about it. You know, tell your family about it. The bigger you make esports, the more likely you are going to have more opportunities and more events to participate in. And also, just tweet about how much you like me, too, because that's just, that will he help. He doesn't need that. Overall, he doesn't need that. Overall, just keep tweeting at me how much you love me, and that, I think, will help the industry overall. So you can put in, a, you know, a good word. I just want to put it on my resume. Send it to all my teachers who said that I was going to amount to nothing. <laughs> Take that. Um, hey, I love hearing from fans, though. Thank you guys so much for asking all those questions. Always a lot of fun. But the fun is not over yet, though, because right now we're going to go to our top 10 plays of the week. Let's get into it, ladies and gentlemen. I love me some top 10s. I'm ready. Tens. Let's do it. All right, guys, starting us off at number 10, StarCraft player Yen Fu from Waterloo launches a surprise blitz on UC San Diego's Flume. In this Protoss versus Protoss mirror match, our blue player Flume is trying to play a slow, standard game. But hey, Yen Fu uses all of his early resources to crank out as many units as possible. With nothing but his first two zealots, he catches his opponent by complete surprise and ends the game and get this, just over two minutes. You can do a lot in two minutes, though. That's a long amount of time. Definitely true. That's enough. All right, well, coming in at number nine, Utah's Overwatch team puts up a strong defense. Having not completed the map themselves, Utah was not in an ideal position and had to put up a great first point defense to have any hope of winning. They sure pulled it off, too, by keeping George Mason at bay down to the last second, sealing the match three to zero. It was close. Uh, returning to StarCraft for number eight, we can see as four infestors come in from the bottom of the screen. Now, they belong to UC San Diego's Blue Zerg player, Light, who has an intimidating army going into the climactic final battle of the game. They were poised to do massive damage naturally, but Waterloo's Riddler managed to get off a clutch, perfectly timed EMP that removed their ability to cast any spells, turning the fight completely in his favor. 
Well, Hearthstone's going to enter in at number seven. Buffalo takes advantage of Northeastern's unsafe position. Despite only having one card to defend them, Northeastern thought they were safe before passing the turn to Buffalo. They were wrong. As Buffalo laid down a discounted King Crush with eight power and the ability to attack immediately, the rush of unexpected damage was enough to win the game and complete an impressive 3-2 reverse sweep. Read them and sweep. Play number six takes us to Heroes of the Storm, where University of Houston, here in red, win a crucial fight in the middle of the map with teamwork and coordination. A fantastic, uh, sorry, a fantastic initiation by Synchrony immediately put Queens University on the back foot as he soaked up a lot of the initial damage. Synchrony's Burrow Charge gave his team all the time they needed to get into position, and with that, they easily took out three of Queen U's heroes at a crucial point of the game. Cracking the top five is the Simon Fraser University Hearthstone team with one of the biggest turnarounds of the week. Here they clearly appear to be on the back foot as USC threatens a huge attack next turn with their army of minions. But with a perfect combination of cards, they managed to turn their measly three damage worth of spiders into a whopping 16, which ends up being just barely enough to take a surprise victory. Another reason to be scared of spiders. And at number four, we have Arizona State Heroes of the Storm with a devastating combo. They managed to land a crushing jaws on three of Rutgers heroes following up with all of their spells to inflict massive damage. ASU's remaining players desperately try to hold on, but the damage has already been done. With a full team wipe, ASU was able to charge across the map and finish the game. Our third play takes us to Volskaya Industries for some more Overwatch action. After an early exchange that traded one kill each between Maryville and UT Dallas, the battle was looking dead even. As both teams squared off, things suddenly took a huge turn as Maryville player Rat landed a crazy five-hero Graviton Surge. His team used the opportunity to completely take out Dallas and swing the momentum of the whole game in their favor going into point B. Ah, classic Rat. Coming in hot! <laughs> At number two, we have another mid-map fight as Northeastern takes on Durham. Durham opened up with a big combo and looked poised to wipe out their opponents easily but Northeastern had other plans as they managed to completely turn the flight around and fight around and end Durham's team. Uh, let's, uh, the crazy part is, after the dust settled, Northeastern somehow came away without losing a single hero. And here at the number one spot, we have an overtime showdown between UC Irvine and Grand Canyon. With Irvine just meters away from reaching their goal, Genos hit a good Graviton surge. Grand Canyon didn't miss a beat, though, and countered with their own ultimate to regain momentum. With, with that, they were able to hold until the last second and push the series to game five. Man, that was, a, that was some sweaty clips. <laughs> that was a lot of great play in there. Nail biters. Uh, now, it's exciting to see uh, the talent that these players have, and I cannot wait to see what they bring back next week. It's going to be, uh, I'm pretty sure, even sweatier. And I don't think that's, I'm pretty sweaty right now. That's hard to do. I can vouch for that. Now, do you think after how the interview went, you'll ever get to hang out with Rick Fox again? Um, what, like in person with him knowing I'm there? Yes, on purpose. Mm, probably not. But hey, I'm good at Photoshop. I can fake some photos, put them up on my wall. He's not watching this, right? Definitely Rick, not. Rick, call after me. I'm that. sorry. <clears throat> all right. Well, you know what, you guys? Be sure to tune in next week to keep up on all the college teams trying to qualify for the ESPN CEC in May. We have a great tournament planned in Houston, and it's looking like it will be one of the biggest college events yet. Call me, Rick. And yes, it's going to be. Also, be sure to follow the Collegiate Esports Championship on social media to be part of the conversation. And you might say, you might, hey, maybe you will see your question on next week's show. Wait. All you got to do is use that hashtag. It's very, very easy. Once again, I am Alex, and joining me today has been Glitter Explosion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. And from everyone here at the studio, thank you so much for watching, and have a great night. See you guys next week. Whew. You guys want to play this uh, this fake NES? I'm ready, yeah. Right. You're you ready to lose? Yeah, let's do it. All right. They have to. All right, let's try the back door. Medivac. Medivac versus Boss. Let's go. Get in position. Medivac is down. It's a base race. Here we go. Medivac takes off. They are on the court. This is in favor. Queen's is about to end this. Sanctification has to go down. There it, there it is. They ripped through it. They've done it. Some of these fights is things like the whole lessons. Packing, packaging that together with a heel, but already he can shut that down. Yeah. And which of ultimates, you have the EMP and more paint coming from Northeast. Again.
really can't get by it as well. Uh, you know, all of the salads kind of going in at once, very few trickling in to just die into a pit of Archons that are all attacking and Pancake's not able to get his Archons to attack without taking a lot of damage first. That Mewpaw's gonna do a second job here, which is just 